I have a holiday present for you, a pot of spoon tender pork shoulder with infinite possibilities. You can turn it into a salad, a sandwich, an entree, or my personal favorite, pork rillette. That's a spread that you often see on charcuterie boards in French restaurants. It's a perfect thing to give out as gifts over the holidays, and it's always good to have on hand for a holiday party or an easy lunch. As always, on this channel, we talk about why before we talk about how, but the timestamps are in the description below, so you can always jump to the recipe. The cut of meat you'll need for this dish goes under the name of Boston butt in the US. It's the part of the shoulder that's right above the shoulder blade, directly behind the neck and head. I know these two pieces look somewhat different, but they were both cut from the Boston butt. You can buy Boston butt bone-in and boneless. I bought mine boneless to save myself the deboning step, and I tried to get at least one piece with a big fat cap. We want all the fat we can get for this dish. The recipes you'll see for the pork shoulder fall into three basic categories. Braising, which is the moist heat, slow roasting or smoking, which is the dry heat, and confit, which is cooked in fat. Confit is the method we're using today. But don't panic, it won't require any extra lard or anything like that. In fact, I believe confit is not only the tastiest, but also the easiest way to cook the pork shoulder, and today I'll try to convince you of that. Here is a crash course on the pork shoulder cooking methods and their pros and cons. In a brace, the pork shoulder is browned and then cooked for several hours in the oven partially covered in sauce until fork tender. The pro of this method is the sauce. The con is that the texture is really varied. You end up with some wonderfully crispy parts on top, some succulent meat in the middle, the bits that were lucky enough to have enough fat wrapped around them, and some drier meat that didn't get much lubrication. The fat texture is all over the place too. The top fat cap renders beautifully and turns deliciously brown, but the inside fat has the texture of blubber. <laughs> Luckily, all these issues are fixable. After cooking, you can remove the blubbery fat, shred the meat to redistribute all the textures, crisp it up in the pan, cover with the sauce, and no one will ever know about those dry parts. Braised pork shoulder is really lovely and completely worth cooking. I'll link to my video on it in the description below, but it does take more effort and skill than the confit. In a slow roasting method, the meat is placed in an open pan without a sauce and cooked at a low temperature in the oven until fork tender. All my favorite chefs seem to like this method. Judy Rogers, Kangelo Pazalt, David Cheng, all have recipes for it. I've cooked them all, and I found every single one disappointing. The textural problems I described with the braise are exacerbated, and there is no sauce to fix them. Here is a picture from the New York Times of David Cheng's pork shoulder. Of course, we don't know who cooked this one, probably not David. Maybe it was Sam Sifton who wrote the article, or even some food stylist. But this is exactly what I got when I followed this recipe. About half of the meat was dry and fibrous. The only benefit of the slow roasting method seems to be the presentation. It's a huge, beautiful piece of meat that looks very festive when presented to the table. But in my opinion, pork shoulder either needs a sauce or it needs to be deconstructed and cooked in fat. The person who gave me the idea of confit was our dear chef John from the Food Wishes channel. In 2014, he made a video of pork carnitas, where he cut up a pork shoulder and baked it until tender. By the end of the baking time, the meat was almost swimming in its own fat. So even if he didn't add any fat and didn't call it a confit, that's what he made. I've been playing with this method for a few years now, and I have a scientific explanation for you why it's so wonderful. Fat has a much lower heat capacity than water. In other words, it transfers energy to the food more 
gently. That's the underlying principle of the French confit method. If you put a tough cut of meat, typically a pork shoulder or duck legs, into fat and cook at a low temperature, it comes out insanely tender without a single dry bite. No matter how low you set your oven, you can't get these results with air or water. In the traditional confit, the meat is covered with duck fat or pork fat before it goes in the oven, but Chef John has proven to me that it's completely unnecessary in the case of pork. All we need are a few glugs of olive oil and a clever arrangement of the fat that pork shoulder is naturally blessed with. Another benefit of confit is its versatility. A braise is great in a sandwich or with pasta, but you can't put it on a salad or turn it into riette. But confit is the one method that can do it all. It's also easier than a braise because there is no browning of the meat or making of the sauce. Now that you know the theory, let's do it. I prefer to salt my pork the day before cooking for better texture and flavor. Check the weight of your pork shoulder and ask Google to convert it into grams for you. Here's how big mine is today. All our ingredients will be calculated based on this number. We need 0.8% of salt, which is 27 grams. 0.3% of sugar, which is 10 grams. Same amount of pimenton, also known as Spanish smoked paprika, and 5 grams of black pepper. Pimenton makes this dish slightly smoky and very aromatic, but if you can't find it, it's okay to skip. If all this math is freaking you out, you can eyeball everything. Most experienced cooks could just wing it. After all, you are Chef John of whether to turn your scale on. <laughs> My confit is loaded with garlic and shallots. The exact amount is not important, but today I am using a whole head of garlic, which turned out to be 40 grams, and six medium shallots, which turned out to be 180 grams. For the garlic cloves, all you have to do is peel them. For the shallots, you need to peel them and slice them pole to pole, just like onions. When the garlic and shallots cook in the pork fat, they become insanely sweet and aromatic. Dump them all into a big bowl and set aside. If you are a laid-back sort of cook like Chef Jan, just cut up the pork into two inch cubes. If you're an obsessive cook like me, you want to be more methodical. If you see huge chunks of fat, score them just like duck skin to help the fat render. You don't need to be careful. It's okay if you cut into the meat some. If you have a fat cap, hack it off. We'll use it to cover the rest of the pork before cooking to ensure that none of the meat pokes out of the fat and dries up. You can certainly just chop it into little pieces, but I find that keeping the fat cap in a few large pieces helps me reserve it for the top, where it will do the most good to protect the meat from drying. Placing it on top also allows this fat to brown slightly, making it extra tasty. Although I'm not chopping it up, I am scoring it to help it render. Add the pork cubes to the bowl with garlic and shallots and sprinkle them all over with the salt mix. Sprinkle some on the fat cup too. Mix it all up. I really should have gotten a bigger bowl for this. Seven and a half pounds of meat is a lot. By the way, you can make as much or as little of this pork as you want, but since it lasts so well, I always make a lot. A few more aromatics that I like to add are thyme sprigs and a couple of bay leaves. Cover it with plastic and put in the fridge overnight or up to three days. Preheat the oven to 300 degrees with a rack in the lower third. Get the pork out of the fridge and find some big pot that will fit it. You can do it in a deep frying pan like this one, in a stainless steel pot or in a Dutch oven. You can even use a Pyrex dish, but I prefer using a deeper dish because it makes it easier to keep the pork covered with its fat cap. If I laid it all out in a flatter dish, this amount of fat cap wouldn't quite cover it. Put a couple of tablespoons of olive oil in the pot and swirl them around to coat the bottom. Find the pieces that have some fat on at least one side and place them fat side down until you cover the whole bottom of the pot. I'm thinking that the fat will insulate the meat from the direct heat of the pot, but I am probably just being obsessive. <laughs> 
dump the remainder of the meat into the pot along with all the aromatics and cover the top with the blanket of fat. If you didn't end up with this blanket, save the fattiest pieces of pork for the top layer and place them fat side up. Drizzle everything with 4 tablespoons of olive oil. Cover with a lid or heavy duty foil if you don't have a lid and place in the oven until the pork is fork tender. If you're only making a couple of pounds, you might want to check after 3 hours, but my 7.5 pounds took 4 hours. To test for doneness, fish out a piece from the middle of the pot and poke it with a fork. It should come apart with no resistance. Even doubt, cook longer. It's always better to overcook than undercook a confit. Once the pork is out, it's very important to cool it for several hours in the fat before straining. I strain it over a mixer bowl since I'll need it later for yet. This is a good opportunity to remove all the bay leaves and thyme stems, but you don't need to worry about the thyme leaves. At this point, they should be so tender that they can stay in. The garlic and shallots will almost dissolve by the time the meat is done. If you find any chunks, leave them in the meat. They are really tasty. Pour the fat and juice into a Pyrex cup or some similar dish and give them 5 minutes to separate. Spoon off the fat into another container with a ladle. You don't need to be obsessive about it. If a bit of fat stays on the juices, that's fine, but we want them mostly separated. You can leave the meat in bigger pieces as long as you're okay with occasional chunks of fat, or you can shred it a little, which will rub the fat right into the meat. This pork will stay in the fridge for a week or in the freezer indefinitely. If you want to make riet, do it right after you process your pork while it's just barely warm. Set a mixer bowl on the scale and add as much pork as you want to use. My total pork yield today was 2200 grams and I'll use 500 of them for riet. Divide that number by 10 and that's your juice weight and also your fat weight. So we'll need 50 grams of each. Fit your mixer with a paddle attachment. Start it on low speed and when the meat starts to break down, crank up the speed and beat the heck out of it. You want to end up with a fluffy and completely homogeneous mixture. If you don't have a stand mixer, you can use a hand mixer or you can do it by hand with a spoon, but I have to warn you that it will take some upper body strength and perseverance. What you don't want to do is puree this mixture in a food processor or blender because the texture will be all wrong. Stuff your riette into jars and push all the way into the corners to avoid air pockets, or put it into ramekins. Smooth out the tops and cover with the reserved fat. This seals the riette from the air and helps it last longer. Here is what 500 grams of meat produced. If I were to turn my entire batch of pork into riette, I'd end up with about 20 little jars like these ones. I'm sure two weeks in the fridge is totally fine, but longer might be fine too. I mean, this was a preservation method in the southwest of France, so I'm sure they kept their riette way longer than two weeks. But they also might have salted the pork more heavily than I did and sterilized the jars. So yeah, I am not sure exactly how long it can stay in the fridge, but it can be frozen almost indefinitely. You do need to wait for this mixture to chill completely before you serve it. In other words, overnight. It's a completely different animal after it's chilled. So if you've tasted it right out of the mixer and didn't know what the hype was about, just wait till the next day. Don't scrape off the fat. It's the best part. One bite and you'll be transported to the French countryside. Serve it on baguette slices, crisped up in butter. And make sure to top your riette with Dijon mustard. I like the whole grain mustard because it's very mild and has a fun texture, but creamy mustard could also work. A typical accompaniment to this dish are cornichons, the tiny sour pickles. Basically, it's a very rich spread, so we need all sorts of acidic things to balance it. Next week, we're turning this pork into three more dishes. 
By the time we're done with this mini-series, your family and friends will think that you became a culinary genius overnight. Graciously accept their compliments and don't tell them how easy this stuff is. We'll just keep that a little secret. <laughs> Here are more very detailed culinary tutorials for you to check out. And if you are ever in the Boston area, maybe I'll see you in one of my classes.